um, with a talk by uh, Dr. Ellen Fox. Uh, Ellen is President and CEO of Integrated Ethics Consulting, LLC. Pr prior to developing Integrated Ethics, Dr. Fox was Chief Officer of the Veterans Health Administration's National Center for Ethics in Healthcare. In, in that role, uh, Ellen and I work closely together to set up the fellowship program between the VA and uh, the University of Chicago McLean Center. And um, uh, you, you, this, uh, the, at the earlier session, you heard Lisa Vig uh, give a talk um, uh, about consulting, and Lisa was one of the trainees in that program. Um, Ellen has over 20 years of experience working with hospitals, healthcare systems, academic institutions, professional societies, corporations, and government agencies. She's become an internationally recognized consultant, educator, researcher, and speaker. Her areas of expertise include ethics consultation, where, uh, in my view, Ellen is the leading authority in the country, ethics education, ethics evaluation, organizational ethics, and ethical issues in end-of-life care. As you can see behind me, uh, today Ellen will speak on the topic of how to speak truth to power in organizations. Please join me in welcoming Ellen Fox. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, thank you so much, Mark. And it's, uh, it's just such a great pleasure to be back here and to be back in Chicago. I look forward to coming back every year uh, to have the opportunity to be with friends and colleagues and, uh, and enjoy this, this wonderful event. Um, I'm going to use my, here it is. I have my own consulting business now, as Mark mentioned, and so um, I have a very clear conflict of interest. If anybody would like to hire me, please uh, come and see me after, after the talk. Today I'm going to uh, share with you some reflections inspired by the job I just left um, as the director of the National Center for Ethics and Healthcare within the Department of Veterans Affairs. And uh, I want to start just by telling you what I'm not going to talk about. This is not going to be a tell-all account of the insider workings of the federal government. I'm not here to air any dirty laundry. Um, I spent 15 years with VA, and I have no desire to say or do anything that would, would harm the organization. What I am going to do is to uh, draw on my experience there to share some thoughts on a topic that I had a lot of experience with and that I think um, has not been adequately addressed elsewhere, and that is how to be effective in speaking truth to power in organizations. So my job at VA was to advise leadership on healthcare ethics um, and to try to promote ethics throughout the organization. And it is a huge organization, so this was not an easy job. But then being a healthcare ethicist in any size organization, I think, is not an easy job. In fact, a lot of your time involves telling people things that they really don't want to hear. You don't become an ethicist because you want to be popular. <laughs> You've got to have tough skin, you know? A healthcare ethicist um, has to be the type of person who's satisfied with the intrinsic rewards um, that come with this important work. So, wh so why do we do it? Because ethicists are absolutely passionate about one thing. What do you think? <laughs> Just kidding. Actually, I think uh, being too passionate about being right can be a huge liability for an ethicist. So it's not about being right. It's about making a difference. I'm passionate about what's right because I want things to be right 
with the world, right? The role of an ethicist in a healthcare organization is not to make ethical arguments for, the, for argument's sake, but for the sake of changing the organization to make it a better place, a more ethical place for patients. So how can healthcare ethicists make a difference? Well, you may be familiar with this concept. It's from Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. You've got your circle of influence. It's much smaller than your circle of concern. And he notes that effective people focus their time and energy within their circle of influence where they can actually make a difference. Uh, by doing this, they gradually expand their circle of influence as they earn more power and respect. And within their circle of influence, healthcare ethicists really can do a lot of things to influence ethical practices. And uh, they typically can exert their influence at multiple different levels, you know, bedside consultation, policy, projects, uh, communicating in the press. Um, but one of the most important things I think that ethicists do is to speak truth to power. Uh, ha here's as good a definition as any for that. This is uh, how it was defined by Ansem Chan, one of Asia's most powerful women, who was nicknamed Hong Kong's conscience before she resigned from Chinese government in 2001. It means giving your best advice to superiors based on the best information available and objective analysis, even when you know it may not be music to their ears. So the bioethics community in Canada has written about the role of ethicists in speaking truth to power. Here they suggest that the role includes the unique obligation of speaking explicitly to moral concerns, direct responsibility for speaking to concerns regarding the moral character and behavior of the organization, and to speak uncomfortable truths. Well, it can be very risky for an ethicist, or for anyone else for that matter, um, to tell those in power things that they don't want to hear, as illustrated here. <laughs> Let the minutes show that Fenwick brought up the subject of corporate ethics. <laughs> But all kidding aside, uh, speaking truth to power can have serious negative consequences, as was the case in VA, where in the wake of the recent wait time scandal, dozens of employees uh, from across the country came forward with claims that VA had retaliated against them for internal whistleblowing. Benji Friedman, in his famous article called Where Are the Heroes in Bioethics, expressed concern that he did not know of any stories about heroes um, in bioethics, such as people who had publicly quit their jobs on principle or out of protest for bad things that were going on in the organization. But I'm not convinced that quitting your job on principle uh, and then going public is necessarily a good thing. Um, you know, others have expressed ideas similar to Friedman, such as Francoise Bayless of uh, this, in this organization, um, Impact Ethics, this is their, uh, from their website. They talk about making a difference in bioethics, but the way they talk about it, Impact Ethics is about using the tools of ethics to shock, press, crack, and chip society into a better place. <laughs> and you know, I find the, the verbs used in this definition particularly striking, pun, pun intended, um, in that they suggest physical force and maybe even violence, right? Um, but I don't see this harsh approach as necessary or even desirable um, in terms of positive, promoting positive change in bioethics. Um, you know, interestingly, the origins of the phrase speaking truth to power really suggest um, the opposite. The phrase originated in this 1955 document produced by a Quaker group. It was essentially a guide to peaceful conflict resolution. In a qualitative study of Canadian bioethicists, Froelich and Chidwick compellingly illustrate the complexity of the choices that bioethicists often have to make. For example, one talked about what happened after he took a principled stance on an issue. 
I don't know if I accomplished anything. It's all nice to take a stand and think I'm doing the right thing, but if you undermine yourself so profoundly in an institution that you cut the institution off from your expertise, it can be a shallow victory. I was right, but so what? Was that the right fight? I don't know. I would today be more cognizant of the consequences of my choice. Well, unfortunately, there are not a lot of resources available to help ethicists uh, make these sorts of difficult choices. As the ASPH publication on uh, core competencies for healthcare ethics consultants points out, bioethicists have written a whole lot on everyone else's ethical dilemmas, but uh, very little on their own dilemmas and how to solve them. So let's take a look at some relevant work from other fields. A social scientist named Albert O. Hirschman was best known for this 1970 book. The basic concept is that when an organization experiences quality problems, clients or members of the organization have two avenues of recourse. They can either exit, meaning they end the relationship, usually to go to another organization they perceive to be better, or they can voice, which is the act of agitating from within to try to fix the quality problem. So when, we might ask, is speaking truth to power a good idea? Well, first, I think it needs to be an act of integrity. Um, Yale professor Stephen Carter has written about this in a book called Integrity, and he outlined three steps that are essential to the exercise of integrity. First, it requires discerning right from wrong uh, by seriously considering ethical questions, acting on your belief about what is right, and openly stating that you are acting on that belief. James O'Toole and Warren Bennis, pioneers in the fields of uh, business ethics and leadership studies, uh, talk about the act of speaking painful truths and propose these criteria that must be met in order for this act to be virtuous. I'm not going to read through these, but things like uh, it must not be self-interested, it must not be done out of spite or anger. Well, you know, I think these criteria are thoughtful but really not sufficient. In my work at VA, um, I face decisions about speaking truth to power in one form or another nearly every day. Um, and so I think that the question for many ethicists is not so much if you should speak truth to power, but how often and how. So I'm going to offer some practical advice for healthcare ethicists, and really for, uh, for anyone who cares deeply about um, doing the right thing in organizations. And my number one piece of advice is pick your battles. So how? Well, first, it's important to be clear on what success would look like. I think it's a mistake to think that informing leaders about a problem is success. That's not success. The question would be things like, you know, how will patients and the organization benefit if you were successful? Um, how likely are you to succeed? You know, this may be determined by um, factors that are beyond your control, but will depend on a very significant degree on uh, your personal effectiveness, which you can work on and um, improve with experience. You also want to consider, if you succeed, how much of a difference would it make? And, um, you know, so for example, sometimes you're aware of wrongdoing, but it's really not that big a deal, so it's better to focus your energies elsewhere. Um, what happens if you fail and what happens if you do nothing? You know, sometimes things just work themselves out without your help. Um, so it's important to weigh all these sorts of questions in picking your battles. So. Just a story to illustrate, um, one day a proposal came across my desk for a very high profile new program uh, affecting about a million patients and costing hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, this program was being heavily promoted by a very powerful um, leader in the organization. And I had huge uh, ethical concerns about the project. Um, I thought it could potentially have some very serious unintended consequences for patients. And so I and my staff wrote up a, a careful critique with some very concrete recommendations on how to change the proposal. So a few weeks later, I was at uh, a national leadership board meeting, which was a, 
a monthly group that I sat on that made all the big um, decisions for the healthcare system. And this proposal was being discussed, which was a huge surprise because uh, it was not on the agenda. So I was not in any way ready for it. I had no notes. Um, and I soon realized what was happening, which is that this powerful sponsor uh, was deliberately trying to railroad it through without discussion. Um, and during the presentation, this person actually looked me right. So this person looked me straight in the eye and during the presentation and said with this huge uh, smile that ethics had reviewed this proposal clearly implying that I had also approved of this proposal. And uh, I was sh completely shocked, and I had to decide in that moment what to do because there was about to be a, a vote. Um, and since I had no time to prepare, I, I really wasn't confident that I would be particularly compelling um, or, for that matter, diplomatic in my approach um, in that moment, um, at least not um, as much as I would have liked to be. And I was pretty sure that speaking up would result in some kind of negative consequences for me. Um, but I also thought it would potentially have a significant impact. Um, and I thought if I did nothing, the proposal would certainly pass and veterans um, could potentially be harmed. So I went ahead and I spoke up. I expressed my concerns publicly. Um, I asked people to vote no until changes could be made in the proposal, and the, um, the proposal was overwhelmingly voted down. And then right after that, the powerful leader um, came up next to me and leaned into me in a very intimidating and actually uh, painful way and whispered in my ear, you have no idea who you're dealing with. Watch your back. So, <laughs> so there can be negative consequences. Um, I thought about reporting that uh, up the chain of command, but in that case, I decided against it. You know, the act in that case, the act of speaking truth to power would have been at least in part motivated by self-interest, uh, and plus, I really didn't know what difference it would make. Um, well, it turns out that within a year, that person was fired. Um, and so, uh, actually based on ethics violations, a uh, little poetic <laughs> justice there. Uh, but anyway, so my second piece of advice is uh, to understand your audience. Professor Guy, don't hide behind sales figures, Bill. We both know terminating me is philosophically unsound. <laughs> You know, this I think can be, understanding your audience can be particularly important for academics uh, who are speaking to, say, hospital CEOs. Um, in the 15 years I was at VA, I had something like nine different bosses I reported to, um, and many more, probably 25 or 30 people if you count uh, the bosses above them. Um, and each one, you know, was very different from the next. So one undersecretary insisted in every presentation you had exactly four slides with five bullet points on each slide. Another insisted on oral presentations, but really you never made it through the second sentence without being interrupted, and so you didn't really have a, a presentation. Um, as a general rule, you know, when communicating with executives, I think the more quickly you can get to the point, the better. Um, but then there was a cabinet secretary who actually would ask for uh, detailed backup ar background articles on, on every issue and would read every word. So um, you really need to carefully observe or otherwise find out what type of information a particular leader finds most compelling. Um, and I'm on the wrong side. So, uh, what do they care about? Well, this is really negotiation 101. Um, you need to understand people's interests. And if you haven't read uh, Getting to Yes by Roger Fisher and William Urey, uh, you really should. It's helpful, enough said. Um, and then what's at stake for them? Well, there's a number of possibilities here. So for many leaders, for example, it's important to save face, and it's important to think about 
um, how to help accomplish that. Um, maybe they are much more likely to take action if it looks like it was their idea, right? Some people are, uh, that helps. Um, or at the opposite extreme, um, in VA, it was often important for uh, leaders to have what was called plausible deniability, right? Um, because whenever something bad happened, uh, Congress would look for somebody to be responsible and heads would roll. So sometimes, um, you know, a leader might go along with something as long as someone else could take the, the credit or the blame if something went wrong. My next piece of advice is, uh, do your homework. If it's important, over-prepare. Um, you know, once a leader has made a decision, um, they're not likely to want to revisit it unless there's new information. So it's important to put your best foot forward uh, the first time around. So you'll want to be able to cite specific standards and data and cases and stakeholder perspectives and so on. And you may need support from allies. You know, some leaders care less about the information um, than they do about who agrees or who holds a particular position. So, you know, maybe they don't really rely on logic um, as much as on relationships. Um, and in that case, it's a good idea to talk to a trusted advisor of theirs um, and get them on board before you talk to a leader. Finally, uh, you really want to be ready with recommended actions. You know, executives in general don't want you to just dump problems on them, you know? They are looking for solutions. What do you advise uh, the leader to do? And if you don't know, you know, do, do some homework and see if you can find out something that would be helpful and so you can suggest at least uh, next steps to, so that you can make it easy for them to, to do what you want and, and to succeed. Um, next, it's important to determine the right method, location, and timing. Um, these decisions are crucial elements of strategy. You know, should you deliver your message face-to-face, -face, email, memo, um, you know, in a public meeting, behind closed doors. Uh, often timing is very important. You know, are they dealing with a crisis right now? May not be the best time to go in and talk about something else. Um, so for some people, this kind of strategic thinking comes very naturally. Um, but if it doesn't for you, then you know, thinking systematically through um, questions like this can be helpful. There are many ways to frame the conversation that um, you can think of as different tools you can use. So the first several items on this list, um, the first five, um, I recommend a book called Crucial Conversations by Carrie uh, Patterson et al. And basically the idea is instead of starting from a position of I'm right and you're wrong and I'm trying to convince you of something, um, it's often the best approach to force yourself to be open and not make assumptions and to seek out the, the other person's point of view um, in the discussion. But in some cases, um, you just want to uh, give advice. And um, I actually gave specific feedback to VA leaders um, about uh, how their, their specific words or actions were affecting um, the culture of the organization. Um, and, you know, I think it made a difference, at least in, with some leaders. But, um, you know, there is a specific skill to this. Um, so I wouldn't recommend doing it unless you're pretty sure you can pull it off. Um, especially, you know, unsolicited advice. But there are a number of good books out there on how to give feedback, and I think some of those can be really helpful for this kind of thing. Ethics trump card. So um, an example of this is I was on a conference call not that long ago where Congress had requested that VA provide certain documents. And, uh, you know, right, Congress has a right to do that, and VA is required to comply. Um, and in the conversation, people were making all kinds of convoluted excuses for why a particular document did not need to be included in the documents that were being released to Congress, because this particular document would make VA look bad. And, you know, the, the rationalizations were really, you know, just um, 
not defensible. There were, I was on a conference call and there were a lot of people and I really could not even get a word in edgewise. I knew I had very little opportunity to talk. So, you know, I pulled the ethics trump card, which I very rarely do. And I said something like, um, you know, as the chief ethics officer of this organization, um, you know, I need to inform you that the key course of action that's being proposed is not ethically defensible and cannot be allowed in this organization. So, you know, that's what I mean by uh, pulling the ethics trump card. And then finally, the integrity statement, what I mean is um, you describe the specific actions you'll be forced to take in order to preserve your integrity and why. Um, and there were a few times in my VA career where, um, for example, I refused to do something that I was asked to do. For example, um, disclose confidential information to leadership. I was on occasion informed that, um, well, I was on occasion informed those in power that, um, that I would have to either talk to a superior or, um, or to an oversight body of a particular situation continued. And um, in a couple of cases, I even had to, I did follow through and, and do one of those things. But I can't emphasize enough that uh, you must use these last two strategies very sparingly. Um, you know, the more effective you are, I would argue, um, the more you should be able to get the job done without resorting to these sorts of extreme or risky tactics. It's also important to uh, keep things in perspective. You know, realize that there are many ways to make a difference. And uh, if you remember that series of circles, you may be better at dealing with some levels than others. And, you know, good idea to go with your strengths or at least develop your weaknesses. You can't win every battle. Um, and sometimes you win even when you don't know it. You know, you don't necessarily see the impact that you've had. Um, so it's good to ask for feedback and and help uh, learn about yourself and understand how you're perceived and whether you're being effective. And then know what lines you're unwilling to cross. Um, there were probably seven or eight times during my tenure at VA that I uh, was prepared to quit on principle if leadership um, did not support my position or do something that I really thought needed to be done um, because it, it, I would have felt it compromised my integrity to stay. Um, on one occasion, I actually drafted a letter of principled resignation that I ended up not needing, um, but I did it as sort of part of this thought process to, to analyze what was going on. So uh, important to know your own limits. My uh, final piece of advice is um, to get good at speaking truth to power, you really need to practice, you know? So if there's an important conversation you have to have, um, role play it with somebody, you know, have them critique your performance. It can be really, really helpful. The more you um, improve your skills at speaking truth to power, the better strategies you will develop, which will make you more effective, which will expand your sphere of influence and ultimately your impact. You know, um, being an ethicist can be a thankless job, but it can also be an incredibly rewarding job. Um, speaking truth to power does not always make you popular, but you've gotta know in your heart that you're doing the right thing and you're making a difference and that's what matters. Thank you. I'm uh, Robert Sebesta from Central Texas VA. Uh, thank you for everything that you've done in the VA for ethics and personally and publicly, I also want to say thank you for introducing me to these amazing people. Um, 
It, actually, I thought this was different from uh, what you were going to be talking about, so I was excited about the topic. I'm going to use some of these things uh, back with the local leadership. Uh, a question along these lines, and hopefully I can get another uh, practical answer. Uh, with VA leadership at local hospitals for directors, uh, uh, being involved with ethical leadership projects is tied to how they're measured and rated. And of course, VA has had problems with uh, how incentives are enacted. Uh, and we've even talked today about uh, how do you incent and do you look at skills versus building character. Uh, is there a way to measure aside from bonuses and pay that will inspire leaders beyond just saying, gosh, I hope you're of good character and or taking the other extreme of, you know, we'll pay you big bucks if you try to change the culture of your facility? I wish I had a short answer to that. I don't think I do. Um, you know, I, I, certainly I agree with you that um, performance incentives can uh, create perverse incentives, um, but they're also a useful tool if, if done well. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, I think, you know, for those of you that don't know, the most recent scandal in VA had to do with wait times and, and gaming of numbers. And it was um, largely understood that this related to some very powerful performance incentives that basically incentivized people to cheat. Um, so I, I would say I think actually performance incentives uh, are good if used well, but I think there are lots of other ways to uh, to motivate people to change their behaviors. I see four other people are waiting to question. Short questions, and we're going to ask Ellen for short answers. Let's Ron go. Miller, University of California, Irvine. <clears throat> Ellen, your courage is uh, <clears throat> most remarkable and appreciated. I wonder what effect you think the 60 minutes expose may have? I didn't see the 60 minutes expose. It probably happened after I left, I would imagine. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Sorry. I'm sorry. My hearing is sufficiently impaired. I can't. Uh, oh, I was just saying, Ron, I'm not sure what the topic was of the 60 minutes expose. I'm, uh, not familiar with it. Right. Too little, too late, perhaps. <laughs> okay. Uh, Eugene Bereza from McGill. Thanks, Ellen. That was great. Uh, my question is, uh, sometimes you really see those kind of situations where the consequences may be to the ethicist, but there might be other situations where the, consequ the negative consequences of less than strategic intervention might be to the whole ethics enterprise. Uh, my question is, um, I I've thankfully rarely, but been in situations where in order to resolve that and make the ethics enterprise not only survive but grow, required an exit strategy and a face-saving strategy for the power structure, which required confidentiality and not disclosing how we got there, which can put then the ethicist in the light of, you crossed over to the dark side and sold out. Have you ever had that experience or any advice on how to handle that? No. <laughs> that was a short answer. <laughs> So, Ellen, um, I want to thank you, and, and I want to thank you for your courage. I do want to point out that um, in response to Benjamin Friedman's Where Are the Heroes, I would like to call out two other ethicists who were former McLean fellows who really have, in a sense, taken, uh, taken some risks in their ethics job. One is Carl Elliott and the work he's done at the University of Minnesota, and the other is Steve Miles, also in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Yep. yep. And, you know, my people keep saying I'm courageous. I, you know, my departure had nothing to do with anything I'm <laughs> talking about here. So just uh, in case anybody's wondering. Go ahead. Thanks, uh, Katie Watson, Northwestern University. Um, absolutely loved your talk. I want to ask you to push further on the definition of truth. That's right. So when we say we speak truth to power, it assumes that I am the person who has the truth. And the next layer for me is as um, financial pressures on hospitals. Um, certainly reach and deepen in academic medical centers where maybe in a previous era we thought that we had shared values of academics and some are transitioning to where finances 
our reigning and branding is starting to uh, creep ahead of academic values, some of us might find us in environments where if there's an organization where there's a shared set of values and assumptions, we might be on a, a shared truth terrain. But when there's competing values or powerful assertions of values where there's a performance of one set of values but that we all understand there's a subterranean driver that's different than that, can you speak to how it, when the contest is not so specific on each outcome or this case or this policy, but it's sort of a broader organizational drift that one is witnessing and accidentally participating in perhaps. What does, what does that mean to speak truth to power about those larger issues of organizational values for patients and for academic freedom? Another big question. Um, Could you, you solve know, that for us? That's my question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, a couple of thoughts come to mind. One is that um, if your personal values are not sufficiently aligned with the values of the organization, you're in trouble. You know, if you are working for an organization where you really can't get behind their priorities, you're in trouble, right? I mean, it, you may be in the wrong organization. Um, on the other hand, some people would say that's precisely the situation where you can be most effective to get their organization back on track. Um, so I think there's not a, a simple solution there. I just stick to, you know, what can you change? How can you make a difference? How can you be effective? And if you can't, then, you know, you're not going to be happy. Thanks.